All right, so welcome to A for Anarchy. I'm here today with uh, Sergio, like uh, last time. I was not uh, able to have a show last week, uh, considering a storm. Well, uh, when I say storm, it wasn't a storm in the American sense. It was more storm in the Norwegian sense. A couple of trees were knocked down, and some people got scared because there was water. Uh, but anyway, the internet connection was shit. And I had no possibility of uh, uploading a video until into this week. And uh, I doubt I'll have this show up and running. Uh, I'm not sure if it's working fine now even, but we'll see. I, I think it should go fine. So I'm going to go on a topic that might be a bit uh, vague to um, people. Uh, there has been a recent uh, threat of terrorism in Norway. Um, the Norwegian security police has claimed that uh, ISIS, the Islamic State in the Iraq and the Levant, uh, has sent uh, homegrown, well not homegrown, but Western jihadists from Syria and Iraq to specifically attack Norway. So what's happened is that the government has uh, decided that we uh, need to, uh, well, have a lot more police in the streets, arm the police, which uh, until now has not uh, had any guns at all, except uh, some of them have had uh, guns in their cars and other vehicles, but uh, armed police is not really common here. But now they have armed the police, and uh, there's a lot more police in the streets uh, uh, to combat this threat. Uh, now, we don't really know what or when specifically they just come out with some information to uh, I don't know, excuse their militarization or, you know, uh, of the police. So one can question the validity of this threat. Uh, I, I don't want to go into any conspiracy theories, I guess, but... Uh, one could imagine that uh, the police security service, the PST, uh, wants uh, to show that they can uh, disarm or uh, prevent uh, any terrorist threat because they have been shit at it earlier, like uh, the Utøya attack in 2011, where an armed Norwegian killed 60 nine people with a rifle on an island and uh, another eight people with a bomb earlier on the day. Uh, they were not able to stop him before it happened. They were not able to stop him while it was happening. In fact, when he was at the island, it took two hours before the police arrived after they had said uh, that somebody had been shooting there. So uh, they have been terrible at protecting people and even the gunmen was so bored by how long the police took to arrive that he called them and said that he was bored and he wanted to stop him, but they didn't come anyway. Well, after a while, so he got so bored he started shooting people again. So this tells a bit uh, about how shit uh, the Norwegian security people are. So maybe this threat is not real, but rather the PST trying to make themselves look better again in the eyes of the public. And of course it could also be an excuse to arm the police permanently. They have they had the high security threat level earlier, it's now been downgraded. Yet it seems the police has not been disarmed yet. So this might be a, a ploy to uh, make sure the police stay armed. I don't know. Uh, even if it's not a ploy, it might be happening anyway, uh, and just natural that police arms himself to obviously protect himself against the population, but oppress them even more. So we'll get right back to this. Sergio wants to come back comment first before we get started on this uh, debate about armed police. So Sergio. Uh, well, we talked about democracy last week, and uh, my friend from work. Um, no names, I'll just call her Tequila. Tequila is awesome. Um, she She's like us. She's an anarcho-capitalist. So that was 
big news to me. Uh, she's awesome in other ways. She likes the cities I like, doing you know activities I like. She has a cute little baby. We'll call the baby Mini Patron. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, like I said, she's like us. She's an anarchist. So that's um, I don't know many anarchists in real life. So that's kind of cool to work with one. Anyway, armed police. Um, I, I don't have a huge problem. The, the problem I have with them is that whatever weapons they have, they're going to use. So, and oftentimes on the wrong people. And here in the States, we have, you know, the Pentagon's donated surplus war equipment to even small little police departments have huge tanks and armored vehicles and SWAT teams and, like, to justify it, they have to use it. And, like, there was a story, uh, there's some, he's a conspiracy theorist and a prepper and some guy, you know, I, I, I didn't read into too much detail, but what I know is they had two helicopters and 150 police officers raiding this guy's home because he was storing food mostly. Uh, I mean, that just seems insane. And, you know, he talk, he's loud on the internet and talks about, you know, various conspiracy theories, but um, none of that is a crime. <laughs> so, you know, what is this raid for? It, it's crazy. 150 police officers. They sent an army, basically, a small little army, to this guy's house, broke down his door, and God knows what happened afterwards. So um, that's my problem with arm and the police. Um, you know, we do have situations where they could use weapons. We have gangs here. But then again, you look at um, what's profitable for gangs, and it's all... They have some extortion, I guess, but other than that, it's mostly victimless crimes. Gambling, prostitution, drugs, that's where they make them, their money. And if that all was legal, we would not have rampant gangs running around shooting each other, and the cops would not need their guns, so, you know, whatever else. Their tanks and armored vehicles and everything. So that, that's the problem. It's all caused by laws. Not all, but the majority of it is caused by the ones I would say. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You also could get the problem that <laughs> there's a police officer with a gun and he's chasing a, a criminal, but always lazy, so he just shoots him. I don't know how relevant the, uh, our light that is, but it seems like a possible scenario when you look at. Uh, huh. Uh, the to police, especially in America, how they act towards the public. Uh, yeah, but yeah, basically, I don't necessarily am against guns, but the police is definitely the wrong people to have guns. They most of their job goals is basically you know picking on people that hasn't done anything wrong in uh, in my uh, perspective. You know, shooting at people for dealing drugs or uh, making drugs or just using drugs or speeding, uh, breaking business regulations. It's all it's all wrong and when you put guns into that into the hands of the oppressors, I would say it's even even worse. And uh, you have in countries like the US you have a lot more uh, police brutality and murder and I would say that's probably because uh, of um, the militarization or the fact that they have a lot of guns. So if you take guns out I think it will be a, probably a bit more peaceful. In Norway there has not been a lot of uh, police uh, and uh, police killing people or shooting. Uh, there's been some of course, of course, but there's a lot lower uh, you know in percentage of the population and it's the same in Germany or Iceland, countries where there's you know uh, the police doesn't usually wear weapons. Uh, Iceland had their first police killing in yes, last year or something, and the U.S. has killed, I don't know, is it 3,000 people since 9-11 or something, the police? Yeah, because um, 
uh, around 3,000 people died in 9-11. So, you know, that's like a benchmark they use. Now the police have killed more since 9-11 than terrorists, including 9-11, um, in the U.S. itself. So, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, they, like you were saying earlier, um, you know, they use these terror threats to justify the guns. And, and you know, we had the Boston Marathon City uh, shooting, the, the explosion, the bombing. Um, and they went door to door searching for the little guy. He's, he's like, what, 19 years old or something? However old he was, they went door to door with no warrants. They illegally searched for him. And, you know, the media didn't do anything. In L.A., there was a cop that uh, was upset, let's just say that, about uh, LAPD. And he killed some people, and they went after him. They found him. They burned down the house he was in with him in it, alive. Um, you know, they killed the guy. Um, at first, they uh, denied doing it on purpose, but there was a radio recording of their radio conversations, and I forget their exact words, but it was very obvious that they just wanted to kill him. Um, they didn't want to, you know, charge him with the crimes, take him to court, and do all that. They just wanted to kill him, and they did, and they admitted to it. And again, the media is all silent on this. The general public is not saying anything. They're talking about, you know, America's Got Talent, or whatever the reality TV show is on the air, and, you know, sports, I like sports, so I kind of, <laughs> I don't mind that, but, um, you know, these are big issues, important issues, you can't have police running around playing judge, executioner, everyone, you know, and killing people. Yeah, absolutely agree, yeah. The Dorner case was, you know, very showed very much how the police didn't care about uh, what happened so long they got to kill somebody. Or well, maybe not that drastic, but they don't really care about uh, the law uh, they so long they get uh, what they want to do done. Well. Uh, before that, they also shot up some truck with two women driving, and because he was driving Dorner. Is that his name? Dorner? He was driving yeah. a truck. And um, the thing is, it was a different model truck, a different color truck. So it's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and, and even if it was the same model and color, you still don't just shoot up a truck for knowing, you know, who's driving or not even uh, at all. You stop and you try to arrest the guy, right? That's normal police procedure, but nah, it doesn't matter. That was in the media, but then again, you, you know, smaller outlets only. You're not going to see this on CNN. It's really bad. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and when you see, you know, a foreign police officer, well, he was a police officer during the incident, I think, uh, Seeing how corrupt the system is, and actually going as far as killing other police officers because he sees how horrible the system is, that kind of so shows you how horrible the justice system is. Injustice system fits. It's more suiting, really. Yeah. And you also have all these other shootings uh, in this year, like uh, in Canada, that guy shot police, and those people in uh, was it Las Vegas or something. Uh, so it, it seems the the police uh, militarization is not going well with the public either. Well, at least certain uh, fragments of the population at least uh, thinks it's bad and will actually resist. And I don't think you've seen as much of that uh, earlier as you've seen, seen the last uh, couple of years, five years. And uh, interestingly enough, shootings by private people are actually down. What's up is the media attention. Of them. Um, you have a lot of copycats. Uh, there was a guy in uh, 
in the theater in Colorado, Aurora. Uh, uh, after that happened, other people went and uh, were caught with like guns and stuff at the same movie in different cities. So you have copycats, and this is one of the reasons the media back in the day would not publicize, you know, mass shootings and things like that. Um, suicides go up when somebody commits a suicide, and it's on the news. And so you don't hear about suicides of regular people, right? Only celebrities because they're famous and people are going to find out anyway. Um, but that, that's why. You have copycats. I don't know why they do this, but they do. So the media attention on mass shootings, it's good to know. It is news. But it's... I think it's used to justify more gun control and uh, more police presence and arming of the police. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's like uh, the terror threat. You know, they use like incidents. The they use incidents to uh, become more powerful and get uh, weapons. And uh, uh, I know you can say abuse their position because their position is based on abuse, but. Certainly more abused than earlier. Uh, it's a terrible system. But uh, if you were to finally remove the shackles of the states and uh, become free, uh, how would you want or think that uh, protection services would be? You think they'd be like the police, or do you think we'd see a more uh, a system more close to you know home protection, where you uh, hire? Uh, security, uh, something like that. What do you think? Um, as far as funding, I'm kind of unsure whether it would be direct or it would be through insurers, like I don't want to call it national defense because it's not a nation, but like national defense, you know, we mostly agree that they would be funded by insurers, so I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, it may be direct instead of insurance. Uh, but um, they would not have any extra power, right, legally. Uh, they would just be regular people that have this specific job. So you, you would have a lot less violence. They would be liable for whatever. We don't hold our um, state police officers accountable, really. Worst case scenario... Um, you know, he's out of a job, and that's very rare. Most of the time they get suspended, and then they get reinstated. And, and they get suspended with pay. There's a video by um, Mike Shanklin. It's kind of funny, but it's also very sad. Uh, he said, it's basically like an advertisement. Uh, it's an ad for extra time off for police officers. Uh, I mean, he's like, just go kill somebody, and you get, you know, a paid vacation of the taxpayer expense, uh, and it's awful because it's true. But um, in a free society, you know, they would not have legal power like that. Uh, they would be held accountable and liable for any brutality, and more likely than not, you would not have, um, you know, these authoritarian types going into the force. It would be you know, more helpful. Like, back in the day, even. I think back in the day, it's, how, uh, it's perceived to be more like that because there was so much less um, uh, technology in private hands. If something happened, you know, if some police officer beat somebody up, nobody knows about it except that guy and a couple of his friends and whoever he shares it with and you know there is no internet there is no cell phone video stuff like that so I think that's part of the thing but um obviously you know the war on terror and the Pentagon donating equipment to uh, police departments that's an issue so I think it's both there's more attention on all the incidents and there are more incidents themselves combination of the two. The free society, that just wouldn't happen. I mean, you still have all the technology and stuff in private hands, but by holding them accountable, accountable and liable, they just wouldn't do it, you know? You don't go... Yeah, I, <laughs> sorry. 
Go ahead. Uh, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree. And when you have the market mechanisms of being able to change uh, change your uh, protection agency, you know, the, they will try to make sure that their police officers or uh, defense people, whatever they would be called, uh, would not, you know, go around beat people up for silly things and, you know, nobody wants to hire people that <laughs> beats up your neighbor or uh, beats up you for that matter or shoots your dog. It wouldn't happen. Now Now we're forced to have this system where we we have to pay for it and, we, you know, we can't our competition, it's not like we can ask them, you know, neighbor government to help us with their police and even those guys would probably be shitheads as well. But in a free society, you, you could choose your own, even start your own protection agency, which of course would lead to competition. And uh, I think that would be pretty good in stopping police violence because uh, you can't just have a, uh, like the commercial, uh, the Joe commercial that Shankla made. You can't have, uh, you don't get a paid vacation just for killing somebody anymore. So I think that would help a lot. Indeed, it would. Um, I, I think some local communities may have uh, monopolies on the police force, so that's kind of bad. I think one way to fund it would be kind of like local roads, um, kind of like an HOA, a homeowners association. If you buy a house in a certain neighborhood, but but the thing is, I don't like HOAs, but they're there. Um, the thing is, you know about it before moving there. So, you know, you have the option not to move there. Uh, but, um, like, say, say a tiny little community has, like, 50 homes. So, by moving there, you would own one fiftieth of the, of the roads, the local roads, one fiftieth of the police force, or whatever they will be called, the, the defense force for the local community. And, you know, it is a monopoly. You don't have an option to buy another service. But still, because they're liable personally and the business is liable, it would work better. Then again, you know, th that might not be the way it will work out. I, I don't know. And that's the beauty of the market. There are many... Many, many people that know this better than me, and uh, they will go in different fields and do the different businesses, and many of them will do this business, and they would have to compete for money, and they would do a better job. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And also, I think we would see a lot of communities where people would go together, probably... Uh, mix of the house is nice and when you move you would look at the house is nice but also at the community if the people are socially conservative or liberal uh, what kind of community you're living in which would give you a lot more freedom to choose the system you are living in if you want to live in a, a socialist commune or uh, just a regular neighborhood where you just to pay for the protection nothing else so we'd have all this uh, possibilities in how we want to live. I would think, of course, I assume one system would be preferable for most people, and you would probably see some some monopolies, especially on uh, defense, but definitely a very smaller uh, smaller uh, area, a lot fewer people, and there will probably be some overlaps too, I would assume, uh, and if it's paid directly or through insurance, I don't think that's imp so very important, you know. <laughs> it's just two bills or one bill with the exact same amount, you know. I don't think uh, it, that's a very vital issue that the states are going to take us down on. Definitely not. Nah, this uh, laws and defense and things like that are the hardest issues. Once you address that, Everything else, I mean, the minicus, this is what they argue, right? You need a state police force, a state army, military for national protection, national defense, um, you know, things like that. Uh, 
beyond that, they're not much different. Laws, I guess, legislature, they like that too. And um, but the thing is, you know, how how are they going to make their laws? Is this a democracy? Because we've talked about democratic, uh, the democratic process two weeks ago. I said last week. I was talking about the keyword, but uh, it was two weeks ago because of the storm. Um, anyway, um, you know, you have special interest groups rising and uh, funding, and then you have the rest of the people, the taxpayers, not very interested because it's going to cost them so little. Uh, it doesn't matter. It would cost more to campaign against it. So, you know, and the biggest problem that I have with Minifis is they still rely on coercion and force to fund their tiny little government. And there is absolutely no protection and no assurance that the tiny little government is not going to go grow into a huge one. And there are statistics on this, like the U.S. You know, back in like the 19th century, the 18th, late 18th century, um, they were spending like two, three percent of GDP on everything. Um, I forget in what year, but uh, when Britain, they did a lot of exploitation, but uh, when Britain was, the British Empire was the British Empire, and they ruled, you know, a quarter of the world or whatever it was, they only spent 10% of GDP on government. Now it's probably close to 50. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So, you know, Governments grow. That's that's what they want is power. So that's what you have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And another, you know, even even if the monarchy isn't a pure democracy, but is a republic, uh, like the U.S. is, or or more at least was, you'd still you'd still find a way to fuck it up. <laughs> Uh, like it happened in the U.S., the Constitution got you know teared apart, I guess, and you basically much. what I said pretty much when you said the uh, U.S. Yeah, Constitution right. has been ripped apart. Uh, yeah. The politicians, we have a constitutional scholar as president who violated the Constitution numerous times. I'm sure there are smaller violations that he does like multiple times a day, but I don't know the details. But the Patriot Act and things like that, the NDAA, um, you know, the, the powers they are claiming, it can't possibly be constitutional. <laughs> but, like, there's no way to argue that it is. They, they're trying to, but like, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, so that makes you have to ask the question to the minarchists, how would the state to run because it seems the only way you could actually have a minarchist state for some time would be to have some sort of military dictatorship where the military is forcing minarchy in a certain geographical area and I don't think that sounds very pleasant having some military general type guy ruling over a large area of uh, the world Indeed, um, they they can't explain this very well. Uh, the minarchists, uh, you know, how they would prevent the state from growing. They they say you know it would be illegal for certain things for them to do, but we see that even when it's illegal for the government to do something, they do it anyway. So, you know, even if they didn't, they could just write a new law and make it legal. I mean, that seems simple enough, right? They make the rules. Yeah, so it's a very odd position, I have to say. And like in Norway, you had this uh, constitutional, I don't know what you call it, amendment, yeah, amendment that said uh, the right to uh, business freedom is not supposed to be infringed any more than it already is. And that 
amendment was created in 1814, and I can guarantee you that there has been business infringement between 1814 and 2014. So it doesn't doesn't matter what kind of constitution you have, you're gonna end up with some welfare warfare state anyway. I agree entirely. Um, the only like in the U.S. we have two parties. They're very similar. Um, they just argue over details, not the big picture, you know, how the country should be run. Well, we want, you know, to ban large sodas. <laughs> no, large sodas should be allowed. That, that's a minor detail, although obviously large sodas should be allowed. But <laughs> in any case, it just, there's a problem over details. Nothing major. Um, you know, the health care bill, uh, Obamacare, that's a bigger issue. But, you know, they're not arguing whether the state should exist or not. They're not arguing over wars. Although they have when uh, Bush was in power. Now it's no longer a problem. Because, you know, if Obama wants to do something, go into some country, the Republicans are all for it. <laughs> And the Democrats, well, he's a Democrat too, so we'll be for it too. So, you know, it, it's horrible. Yeah, the difference is, I guess, the, the Democrats give lip service to the idea of pacifism or, you know, non interventionism, but the Republicans, they, they, they admit that they want war. Pretty much. Um, they've tried uh, passing, no, it wasn't Britain. They tried to write a law last year to attack Iran, and Iran is a huge country, and, uh, you know, they have, I don't want to say, like, a great military or anything, but it's a large country, and the Persians, for the most part, the regular people, they're not, you know, very anti-U.S. Their government is wacky, and uh, they say things. And uh, as far as their nukes, I think that's purely for uh, for deterrence. If they want to build a nuclear weapon, I think it's for deterrence because the U.S. has not attacked any nuclear power since nuclear were a thing. And uh, something like 92 countries besides that. So, you know, statistics are certainly on the side of Iran in this case play in the defense card. Uh, they're not actually saying that. They can't. What they're saying they're saying is for uh, civilian use, like power generation. So I, even if that's true or if it's not true, either way, it's fine. I mean, yeah. Iran should have power, right? Like electricity. <laughs> okay? And um, you know, they're selling a lot of their oil, and that's how uh, they generate a lot of their revenue, and that's fine, too. So they want a nuclear reactor, or several, or however many, for electricity. And, again, if they have weapons, it's for deterrence. I don't, they know, they're not suicidal, they know if they attack, say, Israel, uh, that the U.S. would back Israel up and wipe them off the map, and they don't want that. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree. Uh, but we have to end now. Uh, the time's up, sadly. So it was an interesting debate. Uh, well, not debate. Discussion, really. It's not like we're debating or anything. Uh, so, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, See you later. Yeah, uh, and uh, I hope this will... Uh, Get up on air uh, fast, and I assume the internet is back good next uh, next episode. So goodbye, and uh, see you next episode, guys. <laughs>